All right, CNT 140, Chapter 4, we're continuing on. Um, we're now looking at the section on wavelength division multiplexing. Uh, wavelength division multiplexing is a technique that's going to send multiple signals down a single fiber using different wavelengths of light. Um, and this is a technique that allows for, you know, uh, one fiber and, you know, one fiber that's installed to carry the signal of many fibers. So uh, instead of putting more, installing more fiber, I could add this equipment, uh, your wavelength division multiplexer, to send multiple signals across that signal fiber, single fiber that's already in place. Now, the concept is fairly basic. If we think of the visible light outside, if I look outside the visible light, you know, I, I think of it as like white light, if you will. Well, if I run that through a prism, it bends it into its component pieces and we start seeing the rainbow of colors. Okay. Um, your fiber optic, I can use that technique to my advantage. Um, in the early 80s, they actually they sent light at different wavelengths, 850 and 1300, uh, on one end, and on the far end they basically split those out. They had one sensor uh, uh, sensitive, one detector sensitive to 850 nanometer wavelength, and the other one uh, sensitive to 1300 nanometer wavelength. And filters were being used to filter out the unwanted signal, and both of those signals going across the fiber were able to be read on the other end. Um, and I think it's basically this kind of structure here where you had two different sources coming across the fiber. On the other end, a filter was used to filter out the, the signal not wanted and it would receive, uh, this detector would receive that signal. And over here, this filter would fill out that signal, if you will, so it would receive this signal over here. That's the idea. Um, so I have a single fiber being able to carry two signals if you will um, and that's kind of the first use of back in the 80s well that has um, expanded allowing multiple signals across a single fiber and in some cases you're able to with some specific circuitry this is a single fiber here you can send a signal going this direction um, and the 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 uh, signal is red over here and going the other direction I can send a signal back and it's right over here and again using filters you can filter out the signal that you don't want to see um, so in some cases that can be done for two directions and we said earlier the fiber to the home passive optical network this is the kind of thing that gets used you have the uplink from the, the, the central office to the home um, and in, in the or I should say the downlink to your home and then the uplink from the home back to, to send control signals of like, hey, I am uh, I want to see this channel, I want to see this channel, that kind of thing. Um, so you have the downstream, upstream. Now there is two different types of uh, wavelength division multiplexing. There's dense and there's coarse. Um, coarse wavelength division multiplexing, I have up to like 18 channels uh, of wavelengths. Um, and each one of those are spaced up out by about 20 nanometers. And then there's dense wavelength division multiplexing where you can do 40, 80, or up to 100 channels of wavelengths um, where the spacing is a lot more narrow. Well, that obviously takes a more sensitive system to be able to differentiate those. Um, so different applications there. And again, here's the idea. You have multiple signals coming in and we're using, they're showing different colors here to represent different wavelengths. Um, going across the cable and the demultiplexer on the other end will be tuned. Um, this one, this here would filter out the green and blue to only pay attention to the red. Um, this would filter out the red and blue to only pay attention to the green. And this one would filter out the, uh, the red and the green to only pay attention to the blue. Um, and that's the basic idea behind your wavelength division multiplexing. Uh, and again, there's two different types, dense and coarse. Coarse giving you um, less signals across and more distance between them. Um, and your dense is a lot narrow and a lot of signals. Um, this is showing you here the, the, the sources coming in and the deep multiplexer on the other end to filter them out and go to different fibers. Repeaters and fiber amplifiers. When I have these long haul connections, especially like your submarine cable, um, that signal is going to weaken over time. So you eventually need something in there to 
make that signal stronger to get to the other end. Well, initially repeaters were used where it would receive a signal, you know, a 1010 that's kind of weak, and it would regenerate a strong 1010. That solved the problem initially. However, um, it can also uh, uh, add noise and even in basically uh, repeat the noise if the noise is too bad. Uh, this consumed a lot of power and was a little more complicated. So the solution for that was your fiber amplifier. Uh, the fiber amplifier works in the 1480 to 1650 nanometer band, and it consists of a length of fiber doped with erbium pumped with a laser at 980 or 1480. So what happens then is the, the signal moving through is weak, this section of fiber that's doped with that erbium, a pump laser is shot into it, and that pump laser excites the the signal coming through. Actually, the, the signal coming through excites that and picks that signal up and amplifies it and moves it along its way just by using this light signal with that special section of fiber optic cable. Pretty wild. So if I go back to here and look, um, this in here, this... I think they're actually trying to show it over here, the amplifier over here. Here's that laser coming in to amplify the signal and move it along its way. Pretty cool system. Pretty cool system. Uh, the cable TV fiber amplifiers are used to increase the signal level for cable TV systems. Um, there needs to be a nice, strong signal at the home to be able to uh, have all those channels and receive all that data, if you will. So these get used to uh, have a strong signal at the receiving end. Telephony will combine your dense wavelength division multiplexing uh, to overcome the inefficiency of the couplers for long haul transmissions. So use, using those as well. When we start talking fiber optic networks, um, the wavelengths for transmissions, these are grouped into bands. So as I start looking at these wavelengths of light that are being used, there is actual bands developed for applications. Um, and if I look at the O, E, S, C, L, U band, these are different wavelengths of light and kind of tuned for special purposes. The book talks about a lot about the history of some of these. Um, if we just recognize there are these bands and they're kind of now at this point kind of for specific purposes, um, here's your, your passive optical network upstream. This is the wavelength range used. And your passive optical network downstream, this is the wavelength range used for sending up and down traffic across your fiber to the home, if you will. So this gives us an idea that each of these have been, um, apologies, got an interruption there. So these um, these wavelength bands um, showing us kind of developed historically for specific purposes and what those are. As we look at the, uh, the most popular application for your course wavelength division multiplexing is the fiber of the home passive optical network. Uh, again, you're upstream using the O band, downstream using the S band. So just trying to show you the application of uh, these developments. Measuring your data transmission quality, um, the performance of your fiber optic data link can be determined by how well it transmits data. So if, if we look at any kind of um, a trans transceiver supplying the optical uh, supply the optical to the electrical conversion, if you will. Um, this is we're looking at how well does the electrical signal out of the receiver match the input at the transmitter. So how 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 accurate is this being done? Um, this depends on the optical power at the receiver. So they now mention your bit error rate. This is the inverse of the signal to noise ratio. So here a high bit error rate means the poor signal to noise ratio. So the things that can affect this, um, too much power, the receiver amplifier gets saturated, almost like having somebody yell too loudly or shining a bright too light, a light too bright, bright too light, a light too bright at you. Too little power, noise can overcome your data signal and interfere with the signal. And here again would be maybe somebody talking too quietly or too much noise in the background. You can't actually hear what they're saying. That kind of thing. The receiver power depends on two factors. How much power is actually launched into the fiber at the transmitter end and how much is lost by attenuation the fiber. So if you if you have a you know good strong power at the transmitter 
excellent, but if I have too much attenuation of the fiber throughout, I'm going to get, get a bit error rate, you know, uh, misreading of the data coming across. Um, if I have a low power but not much attenuation, I still might have a bit error rate because there's not a lot of power in the signal to begin with. So your optical power budget of the link is determined by two factors. So the sensitivity of the receiver and the output of the transmitter. Okay, so how good is the receiver at interpreting the 101010 coming in? Um, and how good was the transmitter at sending out a high quality signal into the fiber? The difference between those two determines your loss margin or your power budget of the link. And things like um, connections, you know, patch panels, splices, can all affect the signal. So over here we have a nice strong signal and anytime we go through a connector or a splice there's a little bit of loss. Think about a garden hose you know in your yard every time there's a connection you might have a couple drips of water leak out. Well as that signal moves along anytime it goes through a connection or a splice you have some light loss and you'll have some signal loss. So that whole thing, that whole system, all those pieces can indicate how much of a signal loss along the way. There is such a thing as a link, a loss budget calculator, um, and actually the Fiber Optic Association actually has one out there. I have a link to it here. You can plug in the length of fiber, what its, what its bandwidth rating is, how many times it's spliced, how many connections you have, and it'll let you know how much loss is expected on this cable run before this fiber run before you even send anything through it. It'll give you an idea. Um, as you're dealing with long cable runs, that is something that would need to be calculated and planned for. At the end out here, they, they show you the typical performance parameters of these different sources. Um, and these can these end up getting used in this sort of stuff back here and, and figuring out how much of a signal loss you would have over a distance. So there's an overview of Chapter 4.